Um, I wanted to say to start with that despite of the fact that my uh, calling name is on a slide, uh, this was a collaborative project. Um, a lot of men, a lot of partners uh, and probably people in this room contributed to this project. Um, it was um, uh, coordinated by uh, Ping Sam and Taz Group. A uh, member of the groups are here on the bottom of the slide, Fisheries Management Scotland, Nature Scott, SIPA, um, and uh, Scottish Government, and also a couple uh, district uh, salmon fishery uh, boards. So just to say thank you for everybody who contributed to this. Um, this programme was funded by, but was actually carried out in two, two phases. First phase was uh, funded by SIPA and Marine Directorate, and the second was funded from uh, a Scottish Government Marine uh, uh, Fund, and I think uh, Fisheries Management Scotland submitted project to the fund, and we're successful with that application. So it was uh, really good collaborative work. What was nice on this that uh, a lot of uh, fishery biologists uh, contributed to something in the second stage, and again, I'd like to uh, thank uh, uh, everybody who uh, collected some of us. Um, so why are we talking about pink salmon? Uh, obviously, it's small native uh, in Europe, and for very, very many years there was only a few reports of pink salmon in uh, in uh, Europe. But something has changed in uh, 2017, and uh, there was a rapid increase uh, in uh, uh, fish migrating into European rivers. And uh, these days there are big uh, issues in Scandinavian countries like Norway. Finland and I believe in Iceland these days as well. So what does it look like in uh, British Isles and uh, Scotland? I hope you can see the numbers because uh, the, the legend is quite small, but just to say in uh, Scotland and British Isles, similar situation until 2016, uh, very few fish uh, observed with only 15 catchment uh, reporting presence of the pink salmon. But during the last four odd years, you can see massive uh, range extension of pink salmon with 45 catchments impacted and very many more fish uh, uh, reported compared to that, what, 15 years uh, 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 previously. So thanks to the uh, fisheries management uh, uh, app, uh, the reporting tools uh, we have available to uh, uh, report uh, observation of the pink salmon. We have a very uh, good data on presence of the pink salmon around the Scottish coast. Uh, you can see based on the size of these bubbles that some rivers were visited only once during the four odd years and some rivers were visited multiple times. Uh, you can also see that there is a quite big variation between the numbers reported in the individual odd years. And we think that there might be some pattern emerging here with more fish being reported in the dry summers compared to the numbers reported uh, during the wet summers. But one thing to say that obviously this data is based on presence of the anglers, on a, based on the catch on a rod and observation of other um, uh, river users. So maybe this distribution of the pink salmon around the Scottish coast is purely just um, reflection of where uh, people fish or, you know, so that there might be big uh, um, a spatial bias in the data we have on a pink salmon and some of the rivers on the west coast might be um, uh, underrepresented or pink salmon might be underrepresented in them. Um, so what can we do to improve this monitoring, you know, to get rid of this spatial bias? Obviously, the app is still very useful. It's cheap. It's well established. Now it's running. A lot of people got access to it. A lot of people are familiar with it. So I think it's still a really good tool uh, uh, to continue using the app. Obviously, spatial bias uh, based on uh, the presence of the anglers is a problem. There is also a little bit of problem with the um, subjectivity of some of the data uh, reported on the app because some, some data points uh, reflect catch and rod, actually physical observation of the fish, while other data points might be just um, fish jumping or potentially being someone jumping or some unusual activity in the river, which might be um, associated maybe with some aggressive uh, pink salmon behavior. So not every data point uh, might mean uh, uh, pink salmon, so there might be some um, uh, maybe 
uh, errors uh, uh, in the app, but we're not so worried about it. Still very good uh, monitoring tools. So what are the monitoring tools people have in hand to uh, sort of have a bit more robust uh, uh, data on presence of the King Simon so we can go back into some conventional monitoring tools like electrofishing, trapping, netting, diving, or whatever people use uh, um, uh, to monitor salmon or any of these fish countries we, we heard about this morning. But some of these methods obviously damage the species we're trying to protect, you know, if you net or uh, trap, uh, you may uh, damage the salmon. So we were looking for some non-destructive methods of monitoring an eDNA or um, environmental DNA, which is shed by the uh, fish uh, occupying the rivers. It's actually a really good alternative. So this, Sean asked me just to quickly um, explain what the environmental DNA is and how molecular tools uh, uh, work to detect pink salmon uh, uh, DNA in water. So here you have obviously a river. In the river you have a water and into that water DNA from all the organisms living there are shed into. That could be fish, mammals, plants, birds, human or whatever, pets. Um, and the DNA can be captured uh, in the water sample. You then filter the water either by use of the syringe. I, could, I put some uh, equipment on the table by the door so we can have a look at some of the equipment you use to filter the water, or you use some more automation use of peristaltic pumps or something that should be more kinder to your hands. Um, you capture the DNA or the cells containing the DNA on filter, you lyse that filter in the laboratory, and then you extract the DNA. The DNA obviously not going to only have a pink salmon in it. It's not only going to have the fish in it, but it's going to have a basically all sorts of mixture of the DNA. Uh, when you try to detect the DNA, you have a two different options. You, you either use the single species of assay, which is basically just a PCR designed to detect specifically one species, or you use a metabar coding. Some people probably are more familiar with this so word, but basically in one reaction, you can multiply whole communities of the fish or invertebrates or something like that. So not just a single uh, a species. Uh, the um, single species assay is basically fluorescently labeled probe, which is designed to be specific to piece of the DNA of the single species. And then you have a, pri a primer pair, forward and reverse primer. And if the um, fluorescently labeled uh, a probe bind to the specific target and then releases the fluorescence, then you can see the amplification curve here. So if you observe the curve, you, you can assume presence of the species. If you don't observe the amplification curve, the probe didn't bind because it didn't find the specific target and you have no amplification curve and you can assume the absence of the species. So very straightforward approach, very specific, very actually quite cheap uh, compared to any kind of traditional electrofishing. And from DNA to knowing presence or absence of the fish, it could be a day. So, you know, it's very uh, quite a uh, fast uh, approach. The other thing is better barcoding. It uh, will give you obviously uh, idea about presence of the pink salmon, but also presence of the other fish. So lots of people think, oh yeah, why not to get all the other information I'm, I'm fancy knowing? And uh, uh, to achieve that, you will need a universal primer, so they are not specifically designed to detect pink salmon. Um, you use a high throughput sequencing machine, you get uh, millions of millions of sequences from different things. Some of them would be not correct, some of them would have a low quality. So there is a lot of kind of bioinformatics, analytical, computational effort uh, behind to clean these sequences. And once you have a decent sequences, you then compare them to the databases and sequences are then matched to the species. Again, if the, if the sequence is present, you can assume the presence of the fish. If the sequence is absence, you can assume absence of the fish. There are multiple advantages and disadvantages. Price is one. This is cheap. This is expensive. This is quite quick. This takes a long time, especially because of the processing of the sequences and you need people with the skills who can actually analyze it. Um, in the sort of, we're talking about pink salmon, so one thing it's worth mentioning that metabar coding is often less sensitive when you're looking for a rare target because the generic uh, primers um, basically have a bias towards more abundant targets. So for example, you know, if you have a lot of Atlantic salmon DNA and other species that might potentially amplify your common target rather than detecting your rare target. So I would say that 
if you're only interested in nipping salmon and that's your primary objective and you only have a small budget, then go for the QPCR rather than for metabark coding. Um, if anybody's got any questions, I'm happy to explain this in, in uh, uh, more details. Um, so what did we do in Scotland? Um, we used the uh, species specific approach. We use uh, QPCR assay just to say that there are similar environmental uh, DNA monitoring programs for pink salmon elsewhere in Europe, for example, in Norway or in Finland, and we all using the same QPCR assay, so the data can be relatively compared between the countries. Um, I would say that we probably a little bit ahead compared to other countries because we've done a lot of validation of the tool. Um, we look at the sensitivity sensitivity of the assay, so we diluted the DNA around the assay only to see how sensitive it is, and we can um, detect target down to a few copies. Uh, so very sensitive approach uh, in the laboratory and field conditions. I'm going to talk about the field conditions in a minute. And then we also did uh, some additional work on specificity. So what we didn't want uh, for this assay to amplify other species. So we extracted DNA from other species, from many salmonid uh, species we can expect in Scottish rivers, and also some other salmonid species and we tested the assay and hasn't amplified any of the non-specific targets. So we are confident that the detection we're getting in Scottish rivers belong to pink salmon. I mentioned the uh, infield testing. Uh, we didn't want to rush uh, immediately and you know sample the whole Scotland and then realize that our approach is not very sensitive. So we sort of um, uh, took a little bit of the time and did a few uh, pilot studies. These were done in collaboration with uh, River D and uh, River Ness and their biologist. Uh, thank you again for allowing us to carry out this work. And our feel, uh, feasi first feasibility study uh, took place in 2019 um, in two places, in three places on a, a D or River D and three places in a River Ness. We look at the two places when we know we can detect it and one place when we uh, expected absence of the fish and we got a good match. So we were confident that we can actually detect these salmon when uh, they've been observed uh, by other monitoring methods. And in 2021, we improved uh, on the field monitoring and we look at both a spatial and temporal aspect of the eDNA in the water. So we wanted to know when we can detect it and how far up the uh, uh, river we can still detect uh, uh, pink salmon. So we did this uh, spatial, uh, spatial study on River D. Uh, we collected some for the for the spatial, uh, we went all the way to Balater. Um, we did this twice uh, 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 during the summer. Well, we actually wanted to only do it in once. We went as far as Bankery, and then next day, I think Al told me, oh, it was caught in the Bankery go further. So we went further, and we, next time we went to the Balater. And we did actually um, uh, detect fish as far as just before the Balater, and you know, crossed the uh, uh, river on uh, many points. Um, for the spatial um, aspect, we started to collect water on the 1st of July. Unfortunately, the, the fish were already in the river because the first sample we, we've taken was already positive. So we don't have the data to say that the fish entered uh, a river you know, 15th of June or something like that. They were basically there already on the 1st of uh, July. And we collected weekly samples until the end of September. And then I think it was a two weekly and then Basically, whenever we had a time, we went to the river to collect the samples during the winter months. Um, so this is a copy number of the DNA. Uh, it doesn't really matter if you don't quite can, if you cannot get your head around it, what it means. But anyway, it's a quantity of the DNA uh, uh, um, found in the PCR reaction. And you can see this big peak in about the middle of the August, which probably correspond to spawning of the fish or die or something like that. So suddenly there is a big uh, 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 a spike in uh, eDNA we can detect in the water. The different colors mean the red is a Gardi, which is right here, which is about a kilometer above the uh, tidal limit uh, of the uh, on the river. And the blue is old trees, which is about there, and it's about 10 percent of the uh, a whole length of the river, and you can see similar um, similar data on both of the stations. Uh, these two stations uh, were most consistent in the signal, 
we have a less uh, uh, a consistent detection upper uh, in the upper. Uh, We decided that we're going to collect some blood one kilometer and 10% of the river for each of the rivers we um, monitored uh, uh, last summer. And we also targeted uh, sort of late uh, July until mid August. That was the plan, but things sort of slipped a little bit. So we actually ended up uh, sampling a little bit later. That's uh, summarized on this slide here. So in total, uh, we uh, in the first phase uh, collected samples from 31 rivers. We did it probably mid-August, so we, we slipped a little bit from the original deadline and we collected three water samples of one litre through uh, mesh, which was about uh, 0.22 uh, two microns. Um, in terms of which river we selected, uh, because we have only limited money at that point, we wanted to have a sort of good spatial distribution. And uh, so we decided we're gonna collect, we're gonna target at least one of the river in each of the 11 uh, salmon uh, reporting districts. And we also thought about uh, focusing on the river with special, uh, which are designated as a special area of conservation to collect salmon. In these uh, um, boxes, I don't know if you quite see it, but Colin Bean put a lot of effort into Summarizing this, and in each of them, he calculated how many salmon live, rivers are in each of the box, how many of on how many of them uh, pink salmon were reported from that app, and how many of the rivers are specially specially area of conservation. And we use this to uh, select the rivers. Um, during the second stage of the monitoring, uh, we looked at presence of the uh, pink salmon DNA sort of upstream of the individual rivers. We, we selected 16 rivers or 16 catchments, and we collected some at the um, lower, middle, and upper part of the catchment, and on some rivers, uh, uh, some of them collected also from the tributaries. Um, the second uh, stage, or the tier two, we call it, uh, took place in about late uh, August and beginning of the September, so it was a quite a bit late, but I'll uh, explain uh, the potential uh, issues with uh, collecting samples as late in the summer as that. And in the second stage, we've taken three, two three litre samples with slightly larger mesh. And this was based on the fact that people struggled to filter through the uh, 0.22 micron filter and they were not available anyway. There was a bit of a problem with the supply of some of the consumables. So um, on the next slide are the rivers. Everybody's probably dying to see the rivers. The, uh, um, some, I don't know if people can see it in the room really well, because I'm a bit uh, conscious of the font. This is a lot of information to be packed on the one slide, but uh, if people can't see that, I can talk to you about it later on. Um, in the red, struggling now with that. Uh, in the red are the tier one, the 31 uh, rivers, and the blue ones are 16 countries when we're taking samples uh, upstream. On this slide here, again, I summarized the sampling strategy. So one sample is one kilometer, 10% of the river. The three are the upper, lower, um, and middle, and the number four are the tributaries. So these are the results. I hope you can see in the room uh, uh, all the little numbers, but I explained a little bit of the legend. These small numbers are number of the rivers. They summarized here. Um, the circles mean physical observation of the Atlantic salmon, which is the data taken from the app. Dark circle, it's uh, fish reported on the road. Uh, gray, it's uh, unconfirmed sighting and the clear um, Circle, it's no data on a rock uh, detected. Um, number one, it's the eDNA sample uh, taken downstream, and this one is upstream. And then we have a different categories for uh, presence of the eDNA. I'm not going to overcomplicate it too much, but the red means that we consistently detected eDNA, so we can infer presence of the fish. 
the orange mean that we unconsistently detected eDNA and we only inferring suspected presence of the fish. And when we have no eDNA that we uh, inferring presence of the fish. Um, I tried to kind of explain it on this figure here. So we've taken three samples from each of the samples. We've done four PCR reaction and we would only call it consistent if we have a more than one PCR positive. So that's consistent. The inconsistent would be if we will have a only one PCR a reaction positive in one of the samples, we would suspect it with low confidence. And if we would only have a one PCR in more than one, that we would call it suspected with more confidence. Um, again, I can explain more in detail so if people still don't understand. Um, going to the data, I don't know if it's worthwhile boiling the river or why river, but probably not. The main observation here is that we have some good uh, concordance between the data from the app on the river. Um, Luxford 16 is not, 17 is uh, River Thurzo. Then we have a good concordance with 27, which is River D. On the other hand, we confirm some um, suspected sighting on the river uh, Spey and also the red, which was observed on the river Bewley. All those samples were uh, tested positive, so we can already see the benefits of using eDNA to predict the presence of the species. On the other hand, we had some issues here on river Tweed, where fish reported from the river, and we have nothing in eDNA, but I cover potential um, explanation of that. Uh, a little later. We have uh, rivers which were not positive uh, uh, predicted based on catch on road, for example, here in air or up here at 12 of the east So, you know, as I said at the beginning, the app has some maybe some spatial issues and with eDNA, you can rapidly collect uh, or, uh, samples from many different rivers and maybe um, fill some of the gaps. Just quickly, this is the second stage, and I don't probably have much time left, so I wanted to just say for this, it's a river tweet. It's really interesting because if, if you remember from the first slide, uh, the river was negative for DNA, but actually when we collected more water and we collected more samples upstream and in the tributaries, these samples were tested positive. So it means that when we collected the first set of samples downstream of the rivers, the, river, the fish already moved up and we just didn't take, detect them in the lower stems of the river. So to take the whole message from this is that, you know, we cannot just collect a sample once in the summer in one place, but we really have to think about the behavior of the fish and move up the stream of, of, of the river when required. Um, if I have the time, probably not, just to say that we have a quite good concordance with the uh, first stage and the second stage from River Luxford, they were still positive. Uh, they were collected at about mid uh, August, so you know there was a, probably still a lot of DNA in the river. While some of the rivers which were positive before are now negative, and this is probably purely a reflection that the sample was collected late in the August and beginning of the September, and the fish were already dead and DNA was washed out of the uh, um, river. Um, last slide, I know this one is just to say, I don't know if this was mentioned, but I think there was a trap uh, to potentially catch some of the pink salmon in the river Ferzo uh, uh, put in place and we collected samples below the trap and above the trap and we actually detected some DNA above the trap. Um, so, you know, that would be interesting to, to have a discussion about what uh, these results mean in terms of uh, effectiveness of the trap. Um, and last, just take home messages. You can read it from, from the slide, but uh, just to reiterate that the app is really good. And what it does and the eDNA doesn't is give you data about the um, spawning stages and sex and uh, uh, size, which eDNA doesn't give you. Um, eDNA, on the other hand, showed us that we can fill some of the spatial gaps. It, eDNA, it's high throughput, could be cheap. Um, the sampling design is critical. I'm, I mentioned some of the biases and some of the disadvantages, and we could maybe build an sampling in some of the framework by either government or governmental agencies. And lastly, yeah, it's a method which everybody can be easily trained. So, yeah, thank you so much.